I would like to start my presentation uh, thanking uh, the top ten steering committee uh, for suggesting me as speaker and especially Giovanni uh, for the whole invitation and uh, the organization. As indicated by the name of the workshop, uh, um, I think this series combines uh, dynamical and topological uh, properties in solids and, uh, and in this talk I'm focusing on skirmions as the topological object. Uh, in a second, how do I, oops, wait a second. Hmm. Um, so the outline um, uh, is like that, that I would like to, to discuss with you three aspects, some static, stability, and lifetime, and switching aspects of Skirmion along three recent publications uh, that you can find here. Um, given uh, you which give you the opportunity to study the topics in more detail if you are interested prior i would like to give a brief introduction about the uh, compact um, interface stabilized skirmions and some concepts and uh, and methods um it turns out i exercised this talk yesterday uh, but i couldn't go through the talk because it's a little bit too long so i I decided to take off the switching uh, because uh, otherwise I will be talking more than uh, 25 minutes. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, happy to uh, acknowledge all these gifted people who are part of our Skirmion team. Um, especially, I would like to mention Hong Ying Jia, who does all the initio calculations, Markus Hoffmann, who is responsible for uh, the project of uh, magnetic skirmions uh, at interlayers. Um, Gideon Müller and Bernd Zimmermann have left already. Uh, Gideon Müller was responsible for the development of our spirit code with Fabian Lux, who is currently in Mainz. Uh, uh, I work on Germian rays. Salaman is responsible for our spirit code. Gustav Wiemeyer for the FLIR code. Nikolai Kieslev is the expert on micromagnetics. Christoph Melcher is a mathematician at the University of RBTH Ar Aachen. Uh, he provides us all these uh, absolute uh, exact statements. And Yuri Mokorozov is responsible for topology. And I'm thanking, of course, our funding agencies. Brief introduction. Um, when I think about skirmions, uh, maybe you think about um, uh, uh, an ice hockey field. This isothermal field is the ferromagnetic state, which you see in red. On top of it, you have isolated skirmions like ice hockey pucks here in the field. They are isolated and behave uh, just like particles, but in reality are worlds of magnetic states. But these worlds are not arbitrary magnetic structures, no. They have a particular uh, magnetization texture, and this magnetization texture is such that at each point in, this, in space, the magnetization points in a unique direction. And if you sum this all up, you see you can cover the entire sphere in opposite to the ferromagnet, which covers, covers only the North Pole. And the North Pole uh, and this uh, entire sphere is a different homotopic class. And uh, this whole different homotopic class means that you are in two different topological subsections and you can only move from one topological subsection to the other topological subsections if you rupture the magnetic texture. And you can uh, you can uh, calculate a magnetic you can calculate a topological charge related to this uh, uh, to this homotopic class, and uh, out of the magnetization uh, texture, uh, the equation is given below. We told, we usually call this the topological charge. Uh, the uh, handed the skirmion has different handedness. Uh, so here, for example, you see a, 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 when you go from inside out to outside. Of the magnetization texture, you see that uh, uh, it, uh, the magnetization rotates uh, counterclockwise, while here it rotates uh, clockwise from inside out. We have different type of skirmions. We have skirmions which are which we call nail type skirmions. We have skirmions which we call block type skirmions. The nail type skirmions are skirmions which um, uh, magnetization rotates in the plane of the Z component in the radius. Whereas in the block type skirmion, it rotates at angle phi and, uh, and the Z component. And uh, you see that here in a little bit more detail. Um, uh, these magnetic skirmions are actually minimizer of an energy functional. 
And this energy function is the micromagnetic energy function, which consists of typical uh, suspects. This is the exchange interaction. It is the uh, magnetic anisotropy, and it's the Zeeman field, all written in the language of micromagnetics. And it has an additional, additional necessary interaction, which is the jalajinsky moria interaction. It's a, basically a chiral symmetry breaking, which you see that by the fact that you have a first derivative here, it, the origin comes from the spin orbit interaction in combination with the broken inversion symmetry. And this is absolutely necessary to destabilize the skirmion against the, uh, against the magnetic anisotropy. And uh, the, the, the symmetry of the material we are discussing is actually reflected in this uh, jalotinsky moria spiralization tensor. And um, basically, if you have a cubic system, the tensor is relatively trivial. It's just a diagonal, uh, one in the diagonal. If you have uh, um, an interface type uh, skirmion, then basically you have just these off-diagonal elements. And you see you have one scalar degree of freedom. That's the one which is material dependent or electronic structure dependent. This is the one you have to calculate. And this determines at the end the size of the skirmions, the stability of the skirmions, the rotational sense of the skirmion. While uh, the, the tensor itself defines the symmetry type of the skirmion and the cubic one leads uh, alt without alternative to the block uh, type skirmions whereas the later ones to the near type skirmions. And the, the, the cubic, this one, the, the, uh, the, the cubic one, the bulk one, we call rank three a bulk DMI. And uh, this one we call uh, typically rank two film DMI, jalotinsky moria interaction. And I'm focusing basically on this, in this talk on these near type skirmions of interface type systems. These interface type systems are very interesting because they also tie into a technology because you do multi-layers. Typically, the multi-layers consisting of material, non-magnetic materials of heavy elements like platinum, and iridium. Uh, you can, can come as thin films and uh, also as multi-layers. Uh, typically, you have one uh, magnetic element, which is, for example, cobalt, cobalt iron or something else. And these materials are really here is show you um, an SDM experiment uh, of the Wiesendanger group. What you see in this upper panel here is an SDM image of uh, uh, palladium ion iridium. Here you see the palladium layer. You see a stripe face, and this stripe face is basically a spiral face. You have in this system uh, a uh, magnetic field B0 uh, Tesla, but if you crank up now the magnetic fields here at one Tesla, you see uh, so, uh, slowly the, the skirmions precipitate out of the uh, stripe phase and if you increase the magnetic field you have a, basically a, a, a skirmion lattice and if you increase the field further you have basically the ferromagnetic saturated field. You can also measure with the SDM tip uh, the skirmion profile which means the magnetization profile from inside out. So this is inside uh, and this is outside and this is an angle, you cover an angle from, of 180 degree this is the profile as function of the magnetic field. And you see typical uh, length scales of these atomic scale skirmions is actually uh, two nanometers. This is a little bit later, back, come back to this a little bit later. And you see also, I would like to point out, if you do experiments where you grow this palladium on HCP versus FCC, you see this, uh, the, the skirmion radius as function of the magnetic field, the behavior is different, obviously. Even such things like stacking can have an impact on the skirmion radius, but as we see later, also in the lifetime. Uh, yeah, I don't know what is this exactly, uh, but um, so basically um, we have a, um, in order to describe the skirmions, in order to model the skirmions, we have a, a, a micro. We have a, we have discussed the micromagnetic model, and this micromagnetic model uh, is very good in understanding the mathematics. It gives you analytical solutions. It gives you a feeling for the, the physics. But if you finally uh, want to have a material a rel a relation to a material, it is uh, more much more convenient or much more um, fruitful to work with an atomistic spin lattice model, where at each side of the magnetic state. Um, at each side, you have a magnetic moment uh, of length one, a classical magnetic moment of length one, pointing in a particular direction. 
And you have parameters in this atomistic model which you can determine from first, principle, first principles, for example, from the density function theory. And uh, you can get the energy landscape by density function theory, for example, by twisting the magnetic structure form of spiral, and then the curvature gives you this uh, uh, spin stiffness, and the first derivative gives you the spiralization tensor. Uh, or you can use uh, infinitesimal rotation, then you can directly get the uh, uh, Heisenberg exchange parameter and the jaloczynski moria vectors. And we have developed different tools for that, which are open source, and you can download and do the calculation yourself. So if you have now the atomistic spin lattice model, um, you have basically a description, a model description of the energy landscape. But if you have a model description of the energy landscape, you can do, of course, uh, a lot of interesting physics with it. And for this, uh, we developed um, a um, uh, the spirit code, which is a framework for atomistic spin dynamics. Uh, originally, this code was designed for high school kids. Uh, the intention was high school kids and experimentalists close to a beam line. So you want to, for example, you want to you, you want to do your experiments and at the same time would simulate somehow your, your, your skirmion, uh, skirmions. And uh, that was the intention. Therefore, it runs also on the mobile phone. Um, but over time, people got more and more involved and more and more interested in this code. And uh, so to say, we had more and more feature built into this code. You can do the, the, the dynamics according to Landa lifshitz gilbert equation or Monte Carlo, uh, 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 geodetic notch elastic bands, uh, or you have uh, you can do lifetime calculations with the uh, harmonic state, transition state theory. Um, it has a very nice uh, visualization uh, interface. And uh, in addition, um, uh, Spirit also provides an easy uh, scriptable uh, Python application programming interface to automate repetitive tasks. So usually, uh, I, when I'm in the subway, usually I, I'm, I'm playing with this on my mobile phone to see how the Scramians develop. It's very nice and intuitive when you can download it from GitHub. Uh, so um, uh, one example is this atomic spin dynamics. Um, so you can combine these classical uh, atomistic spin lattice models, basically with the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, uh, and uh, to describe the dynamics uh, of the magnetization. And this external B field here is nothing else than uh, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the magnetization and you get, the, you have then the, typically the precession term, the damping term, the torques uh, due to spin polarized currents. And uh, if you run your thing on the mobile phone, uh, then I recommend you to switch, on the switch off the dipole-dipole interaction because it's a little bit time consuming. We use, that, uh, we use for that a Fourier transform, which is extremely fast only on the GPU. And here I give you a live example, uh, which you can find in the Spirit web. So this is a basically a racetrack uh, memory. Uh, so no, this is a racetrack, I would say a racetrack and two skirmions. And now I exert a, a, a pulse uh, on this, a, a current pulse on these uh, skirmions. And you see the skirmions are slowly mo uh, moving. And uh, what you cannot see is um, the skirmion hall effect. So you expect a small deviation of the skirmion uh, along the path into the in the direction to the north pole, uh, which means this uh, this direction here, uh, and this is uh, because uh, the screaming hall angle is very small. And with this, you can basically uh, can can work with this. A very important quantity is this uh, minimum energy path, and this we obtain with a, a, a geodetic uh, notched elastic band method. The idea is the following. Um, uh, by, for some reason, you know what is your initial state, for example, the skirmion, you know what is the final state, for example, the ferromagnetic state, but you do not know how to go from, um, the, from Munich to Milano over the Alps by the minimum, by the lowest ridge. And you have to find the path of the lowest ridge going from A to B. And so what we do is we have, we take basically uh, um, uh, a path, um, which we do not know, but we, we, we select a path and then we discretize this path and each, path, each discretization point is basically an image of the magnetic state 
and basically we relax now each image of the magnetic state under certain conditions so that the states don't collapse. So basically you have a, a constraint, you go in a, in, a, in a dimensionality which is one lower than the original one. And basically, um, I forgot to say the situation is like this, that I said that the, the skirmion is an energy minimizer. So this, that means is also an energy minimizer in the atomistic model. Uh, since the, the dimension of this atomistic model is the number of sites times, the, times, the, times two, dimension of the spin, uh, which is three, of course, but you have a normalized spin, so it's two, so the dimension is 2n. So whenever you go in one of the 2n directions, that means if you take the skirmion and you move a spin a little bit, always you go raise the energy. Therefore, you have to find this subtle point in the two n-dimensional state. And this is facilitated exactly by this approach. So basically, you try to minimize then keep uh, the distance uh, roughly constant. Uh, you optimize in orthogonal spaces. And by this, uh, you get basically, um, uh, uh, the, you can find the, the lowest subtle point among all the subtle points, um, which gives you then a, uh, so if you have done this, so you know what is your what is your path. You basically know what is the energy barrier between the skirmion state and, for example, the ferromagnetic state. Then you can calculate the lifetime, and the lifetime is given uh, in the transition state theory by an exponential, the barrier uh, which you can have discussed, calculated, and you have a prefactor which is related to the attempt rate, which is proportional to the flux through uh, the dividing surface. And if you assume now uh, that uh, your temperature is low relatively to the barrier, then basically you can um, approximate the energy landscape here at a minimum and at a subtle point by a harmonic approximation. And if you do a harmonic approximation, you can put the energy landscape into your exponential, you have Gaussian into the corals, and then you basically can get the prefactor. And you see the prefactor depends on the eigenvalue spectrum of the Hessian matrix here at the minimum, and also the eigenvalue spectrum at the subtle point. And it has a temperature dependent prefactor, which depends on the, the number of Goldstone modes uh, in, uh, in the initial state and the subtle point state. So basically what, have, what you have is a temperature dependent prefactor which can be interpreted as, um, so to say, an entropy range, because if you have a skirmion, uh, and uh, if the skirmion uh, basically um, uh, is going through, it, going through the barrier, then it means the skirmion makes a small, it becomes very small, and the, the, the size of the skirmion becomes, the size difference of the skirmion come, becomes very large, and this can be interpreted as an entropy change. And this entropy change is huge, and the prefactor change is some of what we know from phonons or, or something like that. So basically, uh, our, our, our procedure is we have an atomic structure. We do density function theory calculations. We, we, uh, we determine the parameters of these extended Heisenberg models. And we do spin dynamics to relax the structures so we know how the Skirman structure looks like. Then we do a, a geodetic and natural elastic band method to get the minimum energy path. We do the harmonic uh, transition state theory, and then we get the pre exponentials in the lifetime. Now let me come to some results, static properties. So I have introduced the uh, micromagnetic energy functional before. Now I solved it semi-analytically by saying I'm interested in near tab skirmions, which are axial symmetric. So I work with a profile, a magnetization profile, which is axial symmetric. It is in the direction of the radial direction and the z direction. I work in a cylindrical coordinate system. I put this magnetization into my energy functional. I have one uh, unknown parameter, which is the, the radial profile. I minimize this uh, energy function according to this radial profile. I get an Euler-Lagrange equation. And this Euler-Lagrange equation is solved by a shooting method with a boundary condition that the magnetization points in the minus z direction, in the core, in the center, and it uh, is uh, points in the, in, the, in the direction of the North Pole uh, in um, the um, 
at the rim. And uh, uh, I work with one dimensionless parameter, which is this kappa. And it, you can think of this kappa as a, a ratio of length scales. It is the ratio of the length scale of A to D versus D to K. Um, uh, and the Skirmion radius I define or is defined in the community as the radius where the magnetization of the Z component is zero. So that would be uh, roughly here, or if you think in angles pi, uh, phi, it is pi half. And this uh, equation cannot be solved. It is, of course, a highly nonlinear equation with uh, sine squares and, and so on. And the solution of it is given uh, in my talk in terms of the domain wall width of uh, the system. And then you see here the solution. I don't know what you see, but uh, you should see it basically an empty square. And what you see in this empty square, basically the Skirmion radius is given in these uh, goldish dots. And you see basically the Skirmion radius is zero, nearly zero, uh, until you come to a small regime where it shoots up. So it's a highly nonlinear solution. And uh, I blow it up a little bit. You see the Skirmion radius as a function of this kappa here uh, in the regime from 1 to 20, which is basically around this corner. And uh, if you blow this up a little bit further in a semi-logarithmic plot, then you see by tiny changes of this kappa, that means tiny changes of material parameters, you may vary uh, the, the, the Skirmion radius by orders of magnitude. And we found... Um, uh, approximation for this uh, for this radius, which is somehow one over the logarithm of root kappa divided by root kappa, or uh, given by the um, Lambert's uh, W function, which is the inverse of x to the e x times e to the x, and looks uh, roughly like this. Um, so it's a high non highly nonlinear solution, and it is a important gives you an important message. So if you want to make a device then you rather want that your, maybe your Skirmion radius is not changing very much while, for example, the Skirmion radius, where the Skirmion is operating. So it means if you have, you don't want to be in a regime where tiny imperfections of your, of your sample changed the exchange stiffness, the jalotinsky moria interaction, or the magnetic NSO, even a tiny bit, because small variations in these parameters may change the radius quite enormously, and that means skirmion changing the radius has to stop, wait until the radius is changed, and then it has to move on. So this means it, that the skirmion motion becomes slow. So ideally, you would want to work in a regime where your, your skirmion radius is rather stable with respect to, um, to respect to changes of the materials parameters. two um, solutions to these equations which are simple to understand. One solution is uh, if the exchange is the dominating, a dominating uh, energy. Uh, in this case, uh, you can uh, take out a couple of terms and you end up with this equation. And this equation is a famous equation. It's basically the Debian-Kolyakov solution, which, is, uh, this, uh, which, which looks like this. So you have a Skirmion's core, this is basically the, the core of the skirmion. You, be, you are at min, the, the, the magnetization points in the minus that direction. And uh, the, uh, with, a, with a change of the uh, um, uh, radius, the, the, the magnetization is changes very rapidly. This is typically called what we call the skirmion radius. And then you see you have a small skirmion radius, but a huge tail of the skirmion. And the other solution, is when you say I'm looking at a large uh, radii, skirmions, then you can take out all the uh, one over row terms, and then you come to an equation which is also very familiar to many of you, which is the domain wall solution. And uh, that means basically the, uh, the uh, magnetization in the core uh, is relatively flat. It stays relatively long in, uh, in this minus z direction, but suddenly it changes into the plus, plus z direction. And uh, from, the, from the experimental data, you are more in this regime than the belleville polyakov regime. And therefore, we have in, for the experimentalists, basically, if they measure all the systems, we have developed a, a web tool. You can simply throw in your, your measured quantities uh, and uh, press a button, and finally, you get out the skirmion radius. 
you can put at this in, into several different uh, uh, unit schemes and uh, so uh, otherwise uh, this goes very fast it's on the web page now let me come to uh, some uh, DFT results so um, uh, so what we did is uh, now we calculate exactly this property for the magnetization, the uh, uh, stiffness, the magnetic anisotropy, the jaloshinsky mori interaction from DFT for, for a couple of systems, for systems which are platinum cobalt multilayers, and the third component is Z. And Z is basically these elements in the 4D series, but also copper and gold and zinc and cadmium. Um, and basically, we are interested to see whether we have ferromagnetic coupled chromions or antiferromagnetic coupled chromions. They have different properties due to the stray field. And uh, so we calculate basically uh, the energy difference between the ferromagnetic coupling and the antiferromagnetic coupling and find that for those which are pinkish here, or pinkish orange, uh, like molybdenum, palladium, gold, silver, copper, gold, they couple ferromagnetically. And all the grayish one, they couple and they're ferromagnetically. So the grayish one have here negative energies and the um, uh, ferromagnetically coupled ones have here positive energies. Then um, we calculated the magnetic moments of this uh, cobalt adjacent to this uh, 4D transition metals and you see quite a variation in the magnetic moment which was down from 0.9 to uh, 1.8 uh, per magneton per cobalt atom. And this reflects also in the uh, exchange energy. So the exchange energy varies uh, uh, from roughly 30 to uh, 150. Uh, it follows basically the, 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 this relation. And if you have the exchange energy and other quantity, quantities like the JIJs, uh, the Heisenberg uh, interactions, then we can calculate the Curie temperature of the system and you see the Curie temperature varies from uh, 100 to, to 800 Kelvin and follows uh, the exchange stiffness. Mm -hmm. Then we calculated the magnetic anisotropy. Uh, you, see, you see a strong variation of the magnetic anisotropy and what you see is in some cases the easy axis is in plane. That's not good for skirmion solution expects an out of plane easy axis so we can, uh, we, we, we should not take into niobium to a technetium into account, but we have strong magnetic anisotropies, for example, for palladium and yttrium uh, and also for zinc. And now we calculate the jaloginsky moria interaction. Uh, here you see the total jaloginsky moria interaction. So you have negative ones and positive ones mean the winding sense of this uh, skirmions will change. And you see uh, the most, the, the strongest come to contribution comes actually from the strong spin orbit element platinum. Basically, this the platinum follows very nicely the, uh, the contribution uh, of the total ones. The other uh, uh, cobalt and zinc contributions to the jaloginsky moria interaction are relatively small. This all together we put now into our skirmion radius equation. And you see here the skirmion radius from zirconium to copper as function of this value copper in terms of uh, the domain wall width. And the domain wall width of these systems is typically in these atomic scale magnetic systems is typically in the order of five nanometers. And therefore our skirmion radius is also, um, you see here, uh, relatively small. So it's about in the order of one magneton, uh, sorry, one nanometers or uh, three nanometers uh, for the copper system. And it is uh, uh, quite consistent uh, actually to the experimental measurements uh, of the uh, Wiesendanger group, uh, where the, which we discussed before, the author in of uh, two nanometers. So this is the right scale for atomic scale skirmions. But of course, this scale uh, might be a little bit too small uh, for experimentalists, especially want to see skirmions should be larger. 10 nanometer would be great. So therefore, the question is, how do we increase the size of the skirmion? And the size of the skirmion we can increase by changing the number of the cobalt layers. Now, I'm going from one system, periodic system of one cobalt layer to a periodic system of n cobalt layers without doing any calculation. So what I'm, what I'm arguing is basically uh, the magnetic 
uh, the, the, the Jaratinsky Moria induction and the magnetic anisotropy coming from the spin orbit induction is an interface space quantity. So, in first approximation, I assume if I change my thickness of the uh, cobalt layer, the total magnetic anisotropy will not change and the total uh, Jaratinsky Moria induction will not change. But what will change is the uh, spin stiffness because this is a bike property. And what will uh, change is the shape anisotropy because the shape anisotropy increases with the layer thickness. Putting this into consideration, I see that my uh, dimensionless kappa parameter depend, depends on this uh, cobalt thickness. And if I take now, uh, uh, if I go now into my radial, radius equation as function of this kappa, I see. Sorry, Stefan, uh, we are out of time. So please quickly. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm needing uh, one or two minutes. This is okay? Yes, it's okay. And then you see basically uh, that uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. um, the, the, so basically you see that uh, first uh, with increasing uh, the thickness uh, due to the uh, uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy, your kappa is increasing and the skirmian radius becomes smaller, but due to the anisotropy, it becomes uh, quadratically smaller and you see your radius is increasing. And uh, to sum this up, um, maybe some of you are familiar with this concept of the reorientation transition. You have an out of plane easy axis. I mean, the out of plane easy axis, um, which is driven by the magnetic anisotropy, you have a competing force, which is the dipolar field. The dipolar field tries to put the magnetization in place, plane. And this is a, th a quantity which is basically thickness dependent. And uh, basically, uh, you get a reorientation transition. And prior to this reorientation transition, you are basically in the limit where the skirmian explodes. And this is then my last transparency. Uh, what you see here is uh, basically now the skirmian radius as function of the thickness. First of all, you see the, again the results, the ab initio results for one layer of cobalt. You see already here that the radius varies by four orders, uh, three orders of magnitude, but the radius is too small. Uh, the radius is very small. And of course, the micromagnetic theory in the limit of uh, uh, at this radius, is, uh, this tiny radius is of course not valid. Here it is valid, but here it's not valid uh, for real systems. But now if you increase the number of cobalt layer, you see this behavior that suddenly the radius is becoming larger. And you, uh, if you would like to have a 10 nanometer skirmion, you basically know how, how somehow how to scale the thickness. And of course, as, uh, if you are in this regime, tiny changes of your uh, experimental parameter space will vary the skirmion radius a lot. But here, for example, uh, you are in a better regime. Maybe um, you are in a flatter regime. So the, the skirmion, the material parameters, skirmion radius is more forgiving with respect to the material, the material, material parameters. With this, I, I would like to stop uh, because uh, the time is up. Uh, I could not show everything, but it's okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention.